everyone, welcome to Studio Sunday. Public service announcement for today. Be sure to turn your clocks back one hour. Oops. <laughs> it's all good this morning, but at 10 p.m. tonight, we'll be feeling it. Yeah. <laughs> I think I slept late today, I don't, I'm not sure. Yes, you did. Good, I'm glad. Do you, do you ever get up early? No. Yeah. Am I missing so let's, anything? Let's qualify that. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I have a little trivia here for you. On November 7th, which is today, in 1637, Anne Hutchinson, Hutchinson, the first female religious leader in the American colonies, was banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony for heresy. Really? Yes. What did she say? I, they didn't say, but the Salem witch trials didn't start until 1692. So those crazy folks had about 50 years to ramp up for it. <laughs> so but that's when they started all this. Oh, my gosh. So just a bit of Rachel Rising backstory. All right. So today is a significant day in Rachel Rising history. That's correct. Well, in the America inspiration oh, yes, of the inspiration. Rachel Rising. Yes. Oh, that was a terrible time. So serial number eight is at Diamond and should be in stores November 24th. Diamond is having some major computer issues. If you have tried to get on their site, you can see that it is totally down. Mm -hmm. But evidently, their whole uh, computer system is. Ooh. So um, we're hoping that the books will still be distributed, that they can still process everything without the computers. But uh, we'll let you know if things change. So right now, November 24th, serial number eight. November 24th? Yes. Wow. Okay, that's news to me. <laughs> that's That seems late. It is late, yeah. because you were late. I was late? Yes. By a lot? I thought I was late by only like two weeks. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not way back to November 24th. Wow. Yeah. Okay, I'm, so, I'm, I'm surprised. Well, don't be. Which, which means I'm way ahead on nine. You're not, because you have to have 10 out in January. Yeah. It just goes... Ch -ch 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 -ch. How? Yeah. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Ah, got it. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, we're also making progress on our Kickstarter, and we'll have more information as we move along. I just want to thank everyone for um, everyone that's been emailing me with all their great suggestions for what to offer, as well as different tiers and stretch goals. So we have a lot of good ideas. Um, and we think you'll love what Terry has come up with. So that will be, we'll announce something probably in December. Um, about what we're going to do for a January or February Kickstarter. To announce, you know, I feel like we're trying to be talked into getting into the pool. You know, I'm not being talked into it. I, I've really been reluctant. I've been very, been holding back on the Kickstarter, waiting Why? for the right time. Well, one thing was because I was on this uh, very stringent schedule with, you know, trying to keep a regular book out. And I didn't see how I could do a Kickstarter and that at the same time. I'm just not organized enough. So with the conclusion of Serial, I'll be able to focus on the Kickstarter program. So that's my plan. Okay. Okay, then let's get on the hot seat. Okay. Okay, our friend Erica Murphy recently reread SIP and has a couple of questions for you. Okay. Uh, these could be long and drawn out, so let's try to keep them. Yeah. yeah, I could talk forever about SIP. I can't seem to lock down when the girls met. It's, it said seventh grade BFF, but the play story suggests high school. When did the girls become close? Um, it, they became close when they bonded um, in high school. Um, so they met in, it's, but you said seventh grade BFF. Yeah, I don't, I don't know where that line is. Did you just make that up? I probably was winging it at the time, like it was early days. Um, and you thought it wouldn't last? Yeah, so nobody hard. would ever remember. <laughs> yeah. It's probably early days and you're just thinking, well, these two grew, grew up together. But um, they may have been one of those things where they had seen each other before, but in high school is where they met and had, they both had their embarrassments and then they bonded over that. Okay. Yeah. And did, could you tell David about her past as a call girl because she felt freer with David? Because she never saw him as a long-term partner and had less fear? Or because she knew he really knew who she was? Did she, did she know David was Darcy Parker's brother? No, because when she met him, she was uh, out of her mind. So he, they had been met before at a Darcy Parker party, uh, but she doesn't remember it. So that really was a shock to her. And I think my thinking at the time, I remember writing that scene, was that um, she just needed to 
get this out. And here was somebody she thought she would never see really again. And so you tell a stranger. Mm. And uh, surprise, he stuck, he stuck around. Okay. Um, sometimes you just need to tell people those things. I never feel that need. That I was a call girl. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's another little question. And then I've got a technical question for you. So we're kind of have a, an embarrassment of riches and questions today. Oh, okay. Have you ever considered painting or sculpting? I think <clears throat> maybe we've, you've answered this before, but it's maybe been a while. Um, yes, to both. Uh, I actually have done some uh, clay sculptures and I had them around the house for a while. Um, I didn't keep them, but it proved to me that I could do it. I, um, and the painting I love to do, but it's messy. And when every time I go in the art store, I think, should I go get some paint supplies? You know, I start messing with the canvas. Um, so I think I'm holding that as rewards for me to play with. I think I, I definitely am going to play with both of those mediums again. Um, I'm just trying to make sure I take care of all the relevant hot stuff right now. Okay. Okay. And a quick question, a, a quick technical question. Is it possible to just dive in and ink without penciling first? Seems like it would be a lot faster. I know it, it would be a lot faster. Um, and I've seen people who can do that and it's amazing to watch. Um, but I can't do it. I mean, I can, when I was young, I used to just get a ballpoint pen and just go for it and just write out my cartoons. But now that I'm doing this, I, it, I find that if I can correct all my mistakes with pencil and I want things to be better and more polished. So I work with the pencils a lot and then ink it. But you can grab, of course you can grab a pen and just go for it. And, and a lot of people do. We actually have a Paul Pope that is just Sharpie, isn't it? Yes. It is. Maybe you can show that. Okay. Um, um, here's an here, here's an image of it. So I think Paul does a lot of ink only. I am don't know if I've ever seen Paul pick up a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he has, but Paul just goes straight to straight straight to the page. That's um, because he's a genius. He's a genius, <laughs> and he his whole uh, foundation is um, tap right into the conscious stream of consciousness. So. He just taps right into his soul and draws. Okay, well, you've got a lot of questions answered yeah. in a short period of time. I feel pretty good about that. I try not to rant. Okay, so that's it for me. What are you drawing today? Well, today I thought I would talk about something I really don't talk about much, which is landscape. Um, you know, when I do the sketches and all that, you really just get the person and maybe a hint of what might be next to them, like a chair or whatever. But the landscapes, if you're going to draw stories, you have got to have setting. The backgrounds, buildings, streets, landscapes, the city, the establishing shot. And I thought I would go over how I do that a little bit. Okay, well, I will see you guys next week. Meet Terry back here. Okay, meet you right here. The first criticism I ever had when I showed my comic strips to a professional was you need a sense of place. Meaning my characters were all in medium close-up like a TV show and you couldn't tell where they were or what their world was like. And I never forgot that criticism. So when I started the um, comics, the first thing I tried to do was establish where they would be. And from page one of like Serial, it starts off showing you that we're in a coastal town, here's a cliff, there's a car on top of the cliff, now we get into our scene. So I go back to my medium close-up television show but now you know where they are. They're here. And that's something that was always missing in my early work. If you look at even the covers, um, they're all, you know, the spooky cemetery, the city park, um, on top of the building on the gargoyle, climbing the mountain, and there's a, a mountain lodge up there. Uh, the spooky outhouse in the woods with the serial killer. There's the cliff again, stormy setting, the walking bridge, um, the snowy uh, scene in the uh, forest, the woods. I mean, it would, now it's all about setting because it's all about the story. And I really took it to heart when I was doing five years. Um, the first thing you, I did was open up with, you know, these 
incredible uh, settings of Kachu's home in Hawaii on the beach. Um, this is the same little house that you saw in Strangers in Paradise. This is the house she escaped to, uh, used to belong to Darcy, and she escaped when she left with, um, got out of Darcy's house, she came here. And this is where she had her uh, dream sequences and all that of Emma drowning and all that. Um, so it, this drawing Hawaii is something that I don't actually get out a photo or anything. I just go by my memory of things I have seen. I think when you see an artist just staring off into the distance, um, you might think, oh, they're just daydreaming. Maybe they're just looking at the landscape and taking it in. Um, you know, there's, there's things that once you look at enough palm trees and clouds and the ocean and things like that, you get to the point where um, it's in your head, you know. Uh, I kind of did the same thing for five years, starting off again in the same location, actually, um, Kachu's Beach House. And this is an interesting thing, though. In comics, you get to draw things you can't actually photograph. This is all stuff that you could go out there on the beach with uh, people and get these uh, snapshots. But in the story, they're watching something coming in the sky. And this is the, I'm telling you this because this is the fun of comics. This is why I do it. In the story, she's dreaming that the sky catches fire. All the hydrogen started catching fire. And now it's a chain reaction you can't stop. And she's watching all the hydrogen combust. That's not in any movie that I know of. And there's no photo reference for it. And so now it's totally up to your imagination. So I took my beautiful landscape, this, and then I set all the hydrogen on fire. You either have to be on a high budget movie or in comics to do that. <laughs> I am so glad that I'm in comics and I can let my imagination run wild. Okay, you know, the beaches and trees are easy. That's one thing. How about Moscow? Can you draw Moscow on a snowy day and they have that big river and all the bridges and the water looks very uninviting. It's the last thing you want to fall into. Um, this I did get out um, Google Images and then I freehanded it um, to the best I could because I thought, you know, if you know Moscow, you'll recognize it. If you don't know Moscow, you won't know if I misplaced that building anyway. <laughs> But why did I go to the trouble to draw all this? I mean, this took all day to draw because it was super important because of the scene that follows. This is, um, you can actually see our character uh, walking up right here. There's our uh, character walking up. And now the scene is all in TV medium close-up uh, format as Rachel meets with uh, this fella and they're going to have a little negotiation and then it goes wrong and they end up in that water that you now know to fear it's too cold to be in there you do not want to be in there and then in the book this is all gray tones but okay that's how that scene starts it all started with that white shot of moscow um okay the coup de grace rachel rising uh, we don't sell the art to number one issues, by the way, anymore. Isn't this funny? You know what this is? This is the actual cover art for issue one. <laughs> that's it. Uh, that's how I got this. Isn't that weird? That's all the drawing I needed to get this, this really iconic imagery. When I do stuff like this, I'm thinking I... If this was a play on Broadway, a big smash hit play, and there was that huge ad uh, in Times Square, what's the most iconic image, you know? And that's what you want, that iconography. And this was my icon image for Rachel. That's what I was thinking. Um, so it opens landscape. Uh, the most important thing was to let you understand that we're in a deep forest um, and that we go into it. We keep going deeper and deeper into it. And I'm using in my own 
best way that I have. I don't have the talent of real landscape artists, but I'm pulling off of so many people I've seen how they do layers and things like that. I mean, this goes all the way back to, to Disney, you know, where you have um, silhouettes and then people walking through the silhouettes. The background is this, I have to ink it, but in a painting, this would be much lighter tones. So it would be faded back and you would actually have mist in there to make it even more faded, especially if this is early dawn, um, which I believe it is. And then you get into the setting here. You can almost hear the birds um, flying up like a Michael Bay movie. Oh, look, they're flying. In. There's doves in the church. <laughs> so that's this is kind of the Church of the Dead out here. And then, okay, here's one thing that I wanted to point out that was really cool. I just need to draw a gully, right? And in the middle of this dry riverbed gully, uh, this horrible thing happens where somebody comes up out of it. But I have to draw the edge of the, the ditch there. And I decided to do this really organic striving, like they're all organic living things trying to claw their way out of hell, or they're trying to pull you into hell. So I went with a very organic looking um, bed, you know, I, I don't know, what, I'm losing my word on this. I think I actually even drew in some skulls, like, you know, scary little features inside here that, thing, little things that you would use to draw skulls or screaming skulls, but it's not quite there. It's just suggestive. And then out of the dirt comes Rachel. Um, Okay, we're talking about Rachel. Let's put one aside for a second. Look at the covers. Uh, looking up from a hole uh, with full of dead bodies and skeletons. The cemetery, just nothing, backgrounds. Uh, woods, pencil woods on this one. Um, the snowy woods, skull, the creepy woods with all the fog. And again, the motif of a silhouette up front, and then those layers that I was talking about where you go back into the faded. Finally able to get this with coloring. Um, the colorist can add the textures that sometimes you can't get with your inks. And uh, another riff off of coming up out of the ground from the first issue. And these um, tree limbs here are rather Adam's family looking. Um, they're almost cartoonish in the way they creep around and it's just adding to a design factor. This overall thing here starts looking like either a creepy moon or a bad eyeball. Um, it's just illusions that uh, so are suggested to you as you look at it. Um, Stonehenge. Uh, this is the creepy cabin in the woods. Um, this could either be Morgan or nightmare movies or whatever. The thing about this was that it gave me a chance to really show these, uh, what I've always thought was creepy, all those sticks up at the top of the trees on the winter time. It gets pretty uh, dense up in there. And then um, she's looking down at a body that's actually been submerged in there. But um, this is the first time I think I've ever drawn the boat launch. Um, things, things like this are things that you see your whole life and then it's time to draw one and you just remember it. You know, it's like if somebody says, okay, draw a frying pan. You don't need to Google that, do you? Um, here's where I'm having fun with the same thing, uh, trying to go for more of a humorous approach to the horror motif, um, combining all kinds of weird, wrong things there. Uh, and here it is in like a reverse imagery. I drew a um, pencil sketch of all of this, and I don't think I've drawn this cover anymore, I'll show you. This is all a pencil drawing, and then I reversed it, um, inver inverted it in Photoshop, and it turned up like this, and then I gave it a, the brown tone in Photoshop. And it becomes this really wonderful, um, kind of very wrong looking landscape. Um, I like this one. Uh, this is the one where the uh, siren 
Rachel as a siren is coming emerging from the organic tree. And obviously it's the tree of death because there are other skeletons in here, maybe previous incarnations of Rachel. And, um, but look at the organic drawing of the tree. This is one of the things I really started getting into all the way from the mushrooms at the bottom and the grass, the dirt, the mushrooms, and it all just kind of works its way up. And I was trying to think in terms of like um, molecular cells, uh, skin cells, the, uh, the way the anatomy of a body or any living thing tends to work in groups of small and large, and then they kind of intertwine and weave, and they work their way towards the end of um, the, the member. And this, this whole tree being the member, of course, and then the limbs. It's just something that when you're drawing it, if I had just drawn a tree, if, I, if all I had done was drawn one of these and then a person sticking out of it, it would not have um, any, any depth to the drawing. There would be nothing to discuss. This one looks like that tree is just as alive as these people, but there's... It's in a hell way. It's in a hellish way. But, you know, a lot of life is very hostile to us. So maybe this tree is very hostile to humans, but it's it's legitimate life on Earth in the, the way that it has its cells and things like that. So I'm drawing this and thinking that way while I'm drawing, and it helps me to get more like... Uh, it look, I'm drawing what I think to be just an endless configuration of muscles and tendons with um, little veins and things like that all across them. And it helps me to try to draw this as realistically as possible as if this tree has been skinned alive and what you find inside there are uh, old corpses and these guys may be all the way from the 17th century or 15th century, whatever. And then the tendrils that hang down like swamp thing that could be moss or they could be what's left of the tree's uh, circulation system, things like that. I mean, you can just play all kinds of mind games with yourself while you're drawing this. And the more freaky you get with your mind, the more it gets into your drawing. And you start drawing more like this instead of, oh, look, a tree with bark, you know. So that's what the mind games are for in terms of like imagination. Um, here's another tree that I drew. Uh, this couple is doing one of the classic Swedish-German picnics from the 50s, you know, those Kodachrome pictures. And then um, th I drew this tree that has every limb has been lost. And now it has kind of like a bonsai look, but all these holes start to look, that's too many, right? It's now that something's weird about the tree. <laughs> now the tree has a story because of all that, all the stuff that it's lost. And these people are forcing themselves. It's like they've lost their minds and they're having this picnic and they're doing it right next to um, the fallen Satan, fallen Lucifer is what this was supposed to be. This is where Lucifer fell and they're totally oblivious in their little swish uh, picnic. Um, here's another example where I pulled landscape and animal together. The snake is really composed like vines and if you look in there, it looks a lot like a very twisted rose bush um, there's actually thorns inside of there and a lot of uh, layering, top layers, medium layers, fine layers inside. This it, Again, it looks like this snake is made out of both, um, I don't know, living things, but also inorganic things, you know, like uh, trees and vines and everything that combines to make things on the planet. And it's all twisted into one big ugly snake. So again, it's something you can't find a reference for on Google, but you just make it up and it's awful fun. Uh, a bunch of crows falling, that's just freaky wrong. <laughs> the burning coffin, um, reaching up. This reminds me of um, so much of like Twilight Zone, an episode of Twilight Zone or something where, you know, the hand, our, our creep show, and the hand comes up out of the grave trying to grab, but uh, death is not uh, afraid. That person there is not. This reminds me a little bit of that guy who used to go out and terrorize the um, the British during the Revolutionary War days. Mythological character. Um, again, um, I'm doing the same thing. You, you, by now, you know exactly what I'm doing, right? 
and I don't even know what this is. It looks like uh, really twisted organic rubber hoses coming up out of the ground. <laughs> Our, I'm drawing it in a way that it looks like the DNA chain, and the DNA chain has captured Lilith and will not let her go. She is unable to die, and this is Lilith, of course. Lilith is um, incapable of dying, um, so I kind of messed with the DNA chain look there. Um, she has probably has 24 chromosomes. And these are just uh, good sketch drawings. There, you know, there's nothing you can add to them. Just a mild sense of place there with the with the cemetery that we all know. Okay, um, I really like this one because this is again pursuing my nightmare of human and uh, forest uh, intertwining in bad ways. And I just had this horrible nightmare of a person, racial, trapped inside the roots of a tree. There's no getting out of there, right? A woodsman would have to come along and carefully get her out of there, but nobody is coming to save her. And then there's the um, uh, the bed of the forest that we had, uh, showed you earlier, the, water, the dry water bed. I went with that theme here for the forest as well. And then there's actually a lot of forest detail in the background covered up by the graphics, but um, it's all covered up and that's okay, that's fine. At least it's there and it works to help provide the setting for the main tree. Okay, and here's, I did draw the bark, but I drew the bark in more of a, a fashion like the thing, where you have a scale layers. Um, it actually looks to me a lot more like, you know, uh, an encrusted the thing from Fantastic Four or something like that, as opposed to just a lifeless tree. And then finally, this one I'll show you. It's, um, uh, this is Jet sitting on a chair. And I have this anonymous uh, ground. You can't really tell what's going on in the ground, but you work your way backwards. And um, with the color change, you start to get to the background and you see this horrible, Everything I drew in Rachel was kind of reminiscent of the Revolutionary War days. So you have this old building, you know, it looks like it's a 200 year old house and the grave site, the tree, this tree was probably gorgeous at one time, but now it's a freaking nightmare. And then um, from all the graves, the family graves that were near the house, and you can actually even see the little bit of the rail fencing there, the graves are, are exploding and getting in a kind of vomiting up their dead. Um, in the middle of this, and that's kind of a subliminal theme of Rachel Rising, is that um, death is not able to hold some of these characters. There's something really wrong going on between life and death in this series. And by exploring that, we dive into deeper issues than Rachel's problems, and it'll, it encouraged me to keep pursuing the story and write more and more about the things that I wonder about and I worry about especially as you get older and older and you begin to think about mortality and everybody looks great for a while, but then they have to deal with this. <laughs> and this whole story of Rachel clashes that together. Um, and I use the landscape to, to also say the same things. So that's what I wanted to show you, um, that you know the landscapes do matter and um, it's worth spending a lot of time to get them right. And um, I hope this helps. See you next week.